So, I want to talk about how we're going to find our way home. So that obviously presupposes that I think we've got a bit lost and um, the reason why we've got a bit lost is because of all kinds of semblance of connection that used to exist between us and landscapes, between us and other people, between us and other species, um, mainly through food is, is what I'm going to be focusing on now. And so in looking at how we, we might get back to where we once used to be, which is basically within a, a, a niche within the ecosystems where we live, or we could say globally, a niche within the biosphere. What I think is, we need to start rebuilding those links, those connections with landscapes, with other species, and also culturally with one another, even biologically with one another, you'll understand what I mean by that later. But those vital connections, the more I thought about it, I thought, well, they're bonds. When we think about it in those terms, we can see the relational aspect that, um, that causes things to be together, to, to, to live together, and, and, and to be joined. From the most basic bonds that we have socially, we look back and see that people used to have bonds with landscapes. They used to have bonds with other species through, through their, their culture of um, totems and taboos and, and other different um, ways that they made things sacred or special or, or managed the way that they interacted with other species. So I'm going to explain about finding our way back home by rebuilding the bonds basically between us, lands, other people, other species. But there's a method for this. And it's knowing. It's knowing what we want. But I'm going to dig a bit into what that actually means. What does it mean to know? And what is wanting? So in other words, I'm going to elaborate what appetite is. And that there was a fundamental relationship, and still is for all other species, between what we want and what we need between our appetites and our basic needs. And not only that, there's a reciprocity there where there's a benefit to the other. And here, like, I'm going to just stand back for a moment and dig into that word home to explain about the other. So the word in Greek that, that can be rendered home or dwelling or even house is, is the word oikos and that's where we get the word ecology from. And it's really nice because there's, there's actually um, a threefold definition to, to oikos which means okay the dwelling or the home, the family, but everything that belongs to the family. So it's the whole thing, it's the whole package. You don't want an empty house with no furniture and no stuff or no people. But in the sense of ecology that's wonderful because it's the whole thing. The whole thing. The land, the ground, the soil, the air, the rain, all of that inanimate physical stuff. But all the species and the way that they network, the way that they connect, the whole thing is home. And it's everybody's home. So there's a shaping that's happened to, 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 to make that all fit together. Just like there is in this house that's been built and crafted and we've learned to live together and all that sort of thing. So. Coming back to that, with, with appetite and consumption being something that is actually a two-way flow. There's a need for wolves to eat certain species so they don't get overpopulated. There's a need for pigs to grub around in the forest to create that disturbance that enables things to grow. And so on and so on and so on. So when we know what we want, that's going to remain a mystery for now, but you'll, you'll uh, hopefully grasp what I'm trying to say by that. So here we are, looking forward, looking forward to a recovered position of home within our ecosystems and within the biosphere. And we're looking back to when we used to be really quite integrated as hunter-gatherers, living um, 
very settled uh, within within ecosystems. And if you ever read or or, or speak with um, in, indigenous people, they always talk about their land being their home, that they feel they belong to the land, almost as if it was their mother or as if it was their spouse. So there's a sense of belonging and home that they have, which we've lost. Um, so we're looking forward to how to recover. But, you know, I think we can look back to those ancestors that I've mentioned, but we can look back a lot further. And that's really where these kind of ideas need to begin. So that's our great, 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 many times recurring, I think it's asexual, so I don't know if we can call it grandmother or grandfather, but uh, way back, that's our ancestor, kind of. I don't think it was actually that kind of single-celled organism that began the things, but uh, that is an amoeba and, and of the same ilk, a single-celled organism. And I think in, in understanding this, um, this web of life that I want to talk about in, in relation to um, the notion of home and belonging and, and, um, and bonding, There's a notion of many, 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 many connections happening between many, many, many things. And you know, that's been described as complexity and there's a whole theory around complexity. And so I'm going to dig into that a little bit now. But just to say, this is about origins, but it's also about how things are sustained. So this is about a journey from and to. And you'll see it's a journey from simplicity to complexity. Having arrived at that point, this is this is the way that life works. And, and if we then start heading away from that, from complexity to simplicity, from many things connecting in many ways to not very many things connecting in not very many ways, we're actually heading back away from the origins of life and, and, and the very nature of life. So saying that, I'm going to give a very lightning tour um, through some cosmology and just say, in the beginning, as far as we know, there was absolute simplicity. There was hydrogen, and then a little bit of helium, and really nothing else. After that, there were stars, and stars started to manufacture elements, so we had a few other things. So now we've got a few things. Now we've got a few things, they start linking up together, and we have, we have molecules. It's starting to get a bit complex. There's more connections, there's more things. Eventually, we have a planet, ours, and there's carbon on there, which, which allows for, for a certain kind of chemical to start forming, called organic chemicals. From there, they get more and more complex, and um, what we end up with is this primordial soup, and it's getting more complex. Now, the thing with complex, what complexity theory describes is the fact that many connections between many things and those connections becoming of a higher quality over time and that complexity increasing and increasing with the same nature more diversity more connections eventually there's something called emergence that happens now this takes the idea of the whole being the sum of the parts to a whole other level because what emergence is is something that you could not possibly have predicted from these elements and even these elements being together and of course what arrives, arises from or emerges from this primordial soup um, is life now if it were possible for there to be someone standing aside commentating on that so no, look, they're all coming together this is looking very interesting I wonder what's going to happen who would have predicted oh it's going to be life it bears no resemblance to what has happened before and then, of course, a while later, we have simple organisms. I think they have our friend again there. And there they are. They're beginning to be able to take signals and information from their surroundings. And they gradually um, become more complex. I mean, it would be, be a while later after this one. And they just start to develop nerve cells that do that, and then more complex, more complex organisms, more complex nerve cells, different kinds of nerve cells, 
different ways for the nerve cells to connect. And so, again, we have the diversity. We have different kinds of nerve cells. We have different kinds of connections, high quality connections. And then something else emerges, and it's consciousness. So all of a sudden, we have conscious beings in the universe. So that, that's 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 the story so far with complexity. We could look at other things. We could look at societies emerging out of units of people. We could look at the complexity of an ecosystem with all of the different um, aspects of that you know ecosystem. And we could look at the biosphere as 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 an emergence, um, and and look at that in lots of different ways. But suffice it to say that this is this is the the time span uh, view of, of uh, complexity, that over time new things emerge and the thing that is um, driving this is bonding. I mean it's diversity too, obviously you need these elements but, but, the, but, the, but the, uh, the mechanism for want of a better word is, is, uh, is, is bonding between the elements and the greater the bonding um, the closer you get to this thing of something something new and wonderful happening. So I want to look at the nature of bonding a little bit now and just, just draw out the fact that there are, there are life-giving connections and there are things called interfaces. I'll start with the connections and just some examples. So these, these are connections circulating water across a landscape that's in Siberia. These are blood vessels running into a brain These are neurons or brain cells in a network, and the lights are neurons firing. And this is um, a spruce seedling, and the root in um, partnership there with uh, a mycorrhizal fungus. So that's the mycelium and the roots kind of enmeshed together, forming this incredible web there through the soil. Um, the mycelium being the main body of the fungus there under the soil. So those are all um, connections. Connections between uh, a plant and soil in this case. And then lastly a bond between two people um, with this nice sort of uh, symbol of the cat's cradle. Um, but you kind of assume these two people are talking and that's the process of um, connection. So now the, uh, the interface. Now I think the, the word interface is really interesting because it, it, it means that point of contact whereby what? Connection, exchange. But look, face to face, um, this, is, this, is, this is how we are as, as humans from the very beginning, from an infant in the mother's arms. This is how we learn to be in the world. We, we see a face and what happens, the face responds to us. So there's some incredible work that's been done in, in the area of psychology um, to do with attunement between mothers and babies and, and, and it, it's very sort of um, simple stuff, you know. The mother smiles and the baby responds, the baby pulls a face and the mother responds and, and you see how um, disruptive it is when that gets slightly out of sync, what, what people did was they um, put cameras in a room and separate the mother and baby so that they were looking at each other on a screen and then they, they messed the timing up slightly so that the mother's response to the baby was actually the response to what the baby had done three seconds ago and the baby just completely freaked out. So this is, this is what happens when that simple flow of um, a two-way exchange of information through faces gets, gets, gets disrupted. That will perhaps be, be uh, more clear the relevance of that in a little while. Um, but that's a simple interface there between um, two neurons or, or nerve cells in the brain. So those little dots there are neurotransmitters coming from, uh, I'm not sure if it's just one way or, or two way traffic there, but um, that's the way information is being passed through those two neurons at that point of interface. That's another illustration of the same thing. This one is, is almost more interesting because this is the detail of that mycorrhizal fungus and root thing that we saw earlier. Fascinating thing with this is that the interface is inside. It's not like your face is there and mine's here and now there's, you know, 
emotion or information passing this way and that across the space between us. There is no space. They are, they are entwined. The mycorrhizal fungus is inside that root and the exchanges are happening right down inside there. Um, and um, you know, there's other examples of that. If you think of the interface between you and the outside world in terms of uh, your um, breathing, the interface is actually right down in here in the micro um, chambers of your lungs, whatever they're called. Um, yeah, so that's that's like a, so that's a thing of, of beings being mixed or, or living things being mixed and that being something of the nature of life and the nature of bonding is that we're inside one another um, somehow. That's another detail of um, mycorrhizal fungus. It's going down into the root there. And that's, um, that's kind of face to face, isn't it? That's, that's, a, that's a graphic of a conversation. That's someone bending someone else's ear. So bending someone else's ear, this is, this is, this is, um, <coughs> this is fundamental to an interface. This is fundamental to a point of contact. This is fundamental to a bond. If I stay the same, then we're not bonding. You must move me, or we're not bonding. I must move you. Okay? I'm not a machine. So living things, they dance together, and they shape and move one another. And how can you do that unless you're entering into the substance of someone? If you're not getting into the eternal, internal uh, form of another, you can't shape them. You can't sort of do it from over here and there's no actual contact. So that actual contact must go within. And in fact, it's kind of like we're a key in a lock. We're able to move and open and change one another. So I'm talking about all the things I've been talking about. Species do that. Now, Darwin's uh, Origin of the Species talked about um, survival of the fittest, and, and, and there's been a bit of a misconception around that, which is that you know, that means the hardest, the toughest, the most enduring. It has nothing to do with that. It means the one that fits the best. Like that key fits in that lock. That's the one that survives. And that's not just like the idea of natural selection is. Okay, so I banged up against this corner here and I didn't quite fit, so I'm going to have a few generations and we'll change genetically a bit and then I'll fit. It's not like that. It's like we were saying, I shape you and you shape me. Species shape ecosystems. It's not just that ecosystems shape species. And an example of that is that the uh, Earth's atmosphere at a certain point was dramatically changed by a certain species that started releasing a poisonous gas into the atmosphere that killed off half of life on Earth. It was called oxygen. All of a sudden, there's a vast opening for species that can not only survive, but thrive in the presence of oxygen, like me and you. And so that's a huge shaping and changing, and we are doing that all the time. We, I mean species. And then of course the environment is certainly shaping us. But this is where I think I can start to um, open up this, this notion of knowledge, uh, I said I would explain. So there's a bunch of people called, well they're biologists and they're interested in knowledge, so they call themselves biological epistemologists. So epistemology is the science of knowledge or the study of knowledge. And they're trying to say, well look, I think we're going to see this guy again. Um, if there's this thing called knowledge, has he got any? 
Does he know anything? How does he know? What does he know? What does knowing mean to a single-celled organism? Nothing. Well, that's why you're wrong, my dear. <laughs> because this single-celled organism knows the most basic fact of life. He knows how to get what he needs from the place where he lives. He's a clever guy. He gets everything he needs. He's not worrying how he's going to pay his gas bill or nothing. He's, he's satisfied. He's living the life of Riley. He's eating like a king. That's knowledge. Knowledge is being a key with the right fit to unlock the stuff that you need from here. Not from there, because you're not there. From here. That's what you need to be able to do if you're smart, if you are knowledgeable. So that's biological knowledge. So I've been thinking and thinking about that for a long time. And slowly the kind of bits have come together. I think bonding is knowledge. Because when I'm bonding with you, Sam, I'm unlocking the good stuff that's in you. Right? And you're unlocking the good stuff that's in me. And we're getting what we need from the place where we live. Because you're here and so am I. Now this gets raunchy. Okay. So now we've had biological epistemology. We're going to have biblical epistemology now. So, in the Bible, there's a description of these guys. I'm going to say they got themselves into trouble, actually. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but Adam knew his wife. And she conceived the son. So that's knowing. That's intimacy. That's becoming one, physically. And look at that connection. Something else arises from a uh, strong connection. So the term in the Bible is to know, yeah? It is to know. It's a Hebrew word, it's yada, it means to know. And, mm -hmm. and it means basically to, to, to just be, to participate in, to be involved in. So it's, it's not just used in the sense of what I just said there. Uh, you know, a carpenter knows wood. It's that kind of thing. You know cooking. You know archaeology. Yeah. You know caring for people. Um, but these guys got in trouble. So what we have is, is, is uh, to me, a fantastic story, which has been interpreted a thousand times. But what I get out of the, the, this story is um, a journey from original synergy to original sin. And the original sin is they stood outside. Okay, so we begin, I think this would be a great type of hunter-gatherer society. These guys are just living. They're, they're flourishing from the land and uh, not having to worry about a thing. They're just like that amoeba, living the life of a king. But they get tempted to eat this stuff it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Another tree called the tree of life. I think that's more where they were before. They were just embedded. Like all the other creatures, they're just taking what was there and moving with the, with the uh, ebbs and flows of, of, of the uh, organic life and the seasons and so on. But now they eat this fruit. And it's the birth of objectivity. objectivity? It's when you stand outside as if you are not part of and look at what you're looking at as an object that you have no relationship to. So the knowledge of, of good and evil, I mean, yeah, I'm sure theologians would club me to death for this particular um, uh, exegesis, but there is proof within the story that they suddenly saw after they'd eaten this fruit that they were naked and they'd never stood outside themselves before to be self-conscious and say, oh, I haven't got any clothes on, I'm naked. So, this is the beginning of problems. So, many, 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 many years later, we have um, 
we, we reach a point where industrialization happens and we start making machines. Now, machines are the ultimate expression of this objectivity that we stumbled into at some point. Because we make a machine in relation to nothing. In fact, we, we, we're trying to not have a relation to anything. I want to get this every time, guaranteed, no matter what's happening. So I've got a machine and it will make this. All I've got to do is put this in and make sure it's got these mechanisms and then it'll give me that. Simple output, mechanical operation of some sort. So simple input, mechanical operation, output. Now before long, we're doing that to fields. So now, instead of having a wonderful complex ecosystem with mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and bacteria, birds and bees and butterflies and lizards and goodness knows what on this expanse, we've got oilseed rape. We've got lots of it, but there ain't no mycorrhizal fungi, no bacteria, no weeds, no bees, no nothing. Just, just that stuff. So we've turned the field into a machine. I put these inputs in, I get this output out. Another example would be um, just a car. So someone invents an internal combustion engine, and this is where it really... It's, it's, the point is, a machine is not responsive, because it's not really there. It doesn't arrive, uh, arise out of this context. It arises out of this context. This context gone out of original synergy into objectivity, standing outside and saying, how may I ensure that I don't have to depend on this or these or anything? Because I have my machine. And as long as I've got the inputs, I can do this manipulation and have the outputs. So I don't need you. And then we go to work and we put the inputs at the hours and we get the outputs of the money and then I definitely don't need you because I can buy it. All of this severs the bonds, it severs the links between us and land, it severs the links between us and each other. And a car is driving down the road, giving me the guaranteed output that I can get from A to B, whenever I want. All I've got to do is keep putting in fuel and water, apply pressure on the pedal, I am guaranteed that outcome. I don't have to ask anyone for anything, I don't have to move through space using my own physical energy, noticing things, I can just pop. However, the thing about machines is that they're deluded. They're not really out of context, they are here. They are made like they're not, but they are. They are here. And they're part of this. So there's this whole wide world of complex ecosystem and geo processes and climate and goodness knows what and for a hundred and goodness knows how many years CO2 see that's an output nobody was looking at and that starts to seriously sabotage this system and the system's breaking down but nobody noticed that and nobody really wants to think about that because we still want that guaranteed outcome and of course you wouldn't be here tonight unless you had that Guaranteed outcome because you were not going to walk from West Pier tonight, Cynthia. But it's hard. We're in this situation where we're very, very dependent on machines. Um, but machines don't—they don't take on board the feedback. We we have to we have to do that for them. And there's an interesting parallel to this. Going back to this issue of faces. Do you know that the fundamental nature of a psychopath is that they are unable to register or comprehend fear and pain on the face of another? They've basically got a bit of their brain that not work properly, called the amygdala. It just doesn't register it. They're confused when they see pain. So the most basic feedback is broken down that makes us empathise that makes your feelings come into me and mix with my feelings and then I come back with a response that can't respond. Machines are externalised psychopathology of a psychopathic nature. 
because we did not want to connect, because we did not want to bond, we objectified. We stood outside and we said, how may I control the world? I don't want to depend on the world. I don't want the world to depend on me. How may I ensure guaranteed outcomes without the need for any of this bonding business? And then I find myself in the place where I can't get any feedback. And of course I can't, because everything I get comes from somewhere else. So I have no idea if that thing you're sitting on was made from wood that cut down the forest where somebody else lived. Because I can't see it, I'm not there. I can't see their face. I'm not getting any feedback. Whereas we used to get everything from here and then the whole world would scream at us if we were causing it pain. So that's machines. That's the severance of the connection. That's where the damage is being done. That's why we became homeless. So how are we going to get back? I think we're onto that now. So again, Ella would like me to tell you that she helped me draw this scruffy little scribble. Um, but her bit is the least scruffy and the least scribbly. She put the hair on and the smile on and the eye on and the earring on and the zip on. There we go. Um, so now I want to just look at some specific examples of how are we going to restore these bonds and how are we going to know what we want. You see, how are we going to know the things that we need by relating in this kind of way I've been describing. So right back in the beginning again, another beginning. So the beginning of babies, the beginning of hunter-gatherer culture. That's trying to illustrate both. So babies connect with the placenta and get everything they need from mother. They're in a safe space of the womb, that's home. But we were in a safe space, undergirded by the fabric of life, by all of this connectivity, all of this complexity, all of these bonds, bonding with other bonds, and meaning that we can't fall, we're sustained, we're held up. And so we bonded with the earth through biocultural knowledge, knowledge of plants that gets embedded in culture, in uh, songs and ceremonies and recipes and traditions and celebrations and harvesting techniques and taboos and all the things that culture uh, gets down into these plants with ideas and imagination and memory and stories like that mycorrhizal fungus got down to the roots. And our food traditions are one of the most powerful examples of that. What do we eat and how do we eat it? And how do we teach our children? But food traditions are biologically mediated. We'll come to that in a minute. And our whole communities were joined to the earth in this kind of manner. But our individual health flourished and thrived because of this connection. This bond between communities, tribes and land. So now we're going back to roots, and this is really what we are talking about, is roots. So this dandelion goes more than uh, four feet down into the ground, and is mining for minerals, and goes deep, deep down. It's become one with, mixed with, participated in the ground. This dandelion knows this ground. Now, I've got a tremendous privilege to meet this lady and to go to this place and watch her dig this loop. I didn't take that photograph, but um, that is a long yam. It's a wonderful, um, well, yam, edible root that grows in the Northern Territory in Australia. But this lady is, a, is, an, is an elder in her tribe. And the same tribe have harvested this same root in the same place for we don't know how long. It could be 50,000 years. It's a long, 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 long time. It's just one little place. We had to travel a distance to get to this one hill where they always go for the long yams. And she's passed the knowledge on to her, to, to her daughter. Her daughter is doing an amazing job of documenting this traditional knowledge. I have the book that she helped put together. Um, and passing on the traditions of where to find it how to harvest it, how to tend it so it keeps going, how to cook it. It's being passed on. 
And that too is a bond, right, that the, the, the traditions have passed on. Back to the machines now, these days we only dig deep into the soil for oil in order to fuel vast monocultures of energy crops. So we're taking this energy and we're using it to get this kind of stuff. So these are the world's major food crops. So of the 5 billion tonnes of food produced by these major food crops every year, more than 2 billion are sugar. Just sugar. From beet, sugar cane and um, maize. And the rest of the 5 billion are almost entirely also energy crops. So that we're eating one thing. And remember what I said earlier, if we move away from complexity towards simplicity, if we move away from diversity towards homogeneity, that's a move away from the development of life. That must be a movement towards death in my book. It's a negation. So that's mostly what we eat globally, are these energy crops, and they're fueled. They're fueled by that. But if you think about it, that's dead stuff from millions of years ago. So we're, we're dragging up dead things to, um, to uh, push our diet and our food culture in the direction of simplicity, lack of connection, lack of diversity, and death. Um, and that's quite literally true because all of the, all of the major diseases of civilization, heart disease, cancer and uh, diabetes, they are all a function of the fact that people's diets are just so completely rubbish. No one's eating antioxidants and minerals and vitamins and um, you know, whilst that's not the only reason people suffer from those illnesses, the, the, if you look at societies um, where traditional diets are still in place, the incidence of all of those diseases are way down. So, that relationship between people and landscape is, is always profound because that's what species do. Like I said, people uh, are just the same as any other species that gets what it needs, where it lives. So the links will happen unless you have something that's going to sabotage it. Until this disease of the objectivity that takes me out of context, I can't help it. I'm just going to relate to my surroundings. I just can't help it. Unless someone is, is, is blocking that and undoing that. And this is what these guys did. So this, this is a picture of early farming. And um, it turns out that early farming methods in, in this country greatly enhanced the uh, complexity and diversity of our ecosystems. Right up until the time of just before the Industrial Revolution, the species diversity uh, or biodiversity in, in the UK um, was increasing and it reached a pinnacle around about 1700. Um, however, that's not for me a, uh, necessarily an endorsement of, of farming. It just, just means that human activity was doing lots of different things and it created, um, it created disturbance that gave rise to complexity and diversity, basically. Uh, on a human level, not such a good idea because um, the agricultural diet is known to have um, been uh, much poorer, or is known generally to be much poorer than hunter-gatherer diets. And the way they found that is that the, the mean height of population just after agriculture started in lots of different places has been uh, measured in terms of skeletons uh, just before and after and, and, and the height went way down and that's, that is a function of childhood nutrition, the, the, uh, the adult height. Um, so in many ways the diet was bad but, but, but biodiversity in this country certainly um, benefited from human presence is, is the point I'm making here. Um, elsewhere where you have much more long-standing hunter-gatherer cultures, the best example of which is, is uh, Australia, the, the, um, the biomass as well as the biodiversity was greatly enhanced by the many techniques that they had for managing the landscape. Um, 
And again, it's because they were not trying to um, create monocultures anywhere. They were not trying to dominate the landscape. They were trying to trying to uh, you know um, respect and, and 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 care for it in many different ways, like the use of fire uh, that enabled a lot of seeds to germinate that wouldn't have germinated otherwise. It gave other plants a chance to grow through. It gave grazing for um, animals which they did hunt, but they also created spaces where the, where the animals would be safe and, and not hunted. So, um, yeah, in essence, what I'm saying is that human presence enhances biodiversity, and, and yet at the moment what we see is, is a massive uh, movement of extinction. Um, but it's not because humans are here, it's because humans have got into this um, sabotage mode because we are basing ourselves um, around machines which in, in, in themselves are based around this I will stand outside and I won't see your face so I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so we are causing great uh, damage and destruction to, to a planet whose face we refuse to um, see. So there's the enhancement and the benefit that comes to um, diversity biodiversity and, 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 and land, what I've just talked about. Here is um, the, the sort of key to, to why the hunter-gatherer diet was so good um, in terms of human health. Simply, they ate so many things. Now I know just from wild plants that wild plants are much more nutritious than um, cultivated ones. And um, and they're, 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 they're more nutritious in, 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 in a diversity of ways. So in other words, they have different profiles of nutrition. But imagine if I'm eating lots of wild plants, then I'm eating lots of things that are more nutritious. Whereas if you don't eat any wild plants, you're eating fewer things which are not very nutritious. So it's obvious to see that the, be the benefits of that are going to just um, accrue. But then you see that they're not just eating lots of wild plants. They're eating all the different kinds of the plant up there, but they're eating many different kinds of uh, meat from different species and then marine algae and insects and all kinds of um, amazing stuff. Um, and that actually links into the previous thing about the biodiversity because um, someone did a study of, of uh, human food webs, there's been a lot of work on food webs as, as a branch of ecology but in, uh, in an area of, uh, I think it's an island off Canada they looked at the, the food web of a tribe who they're still surviving members of that tribe but, but they don't live as hunter-gatherers but they were able to look at historical stuff and interview people of the tribe and work out what did they eat and how did it all work um, and they drew this, this, uh, this, this web and, and, and then they did models, sort of computer models what they're basically trying to look at is what, what is the effect of all of these people eating lots of stuff and they found that the effect was, was, was minimal it, it, it wasn't causing um, species loss, it was causing a kind of ebb and flow. And the reason why is because humans are flexible omnivores, ordinarily, when we're not shopping for supermarkets. They would eat and eat and eat and eat the thing that was super abundant. And then it's starting to decrease and they think, hey, let's get this thing over here that's super abundant and leave it to recover. And it wasn't even necessarily a conscious strategy. It probably was in terms of taboos and culture. There were probably mechanisms in there. But just, just the simple point that there's not so much of this stuff now. And we're going to get the stuff over here. There's more. Flexible omnivores. It turns out that in that respect, we are just like cod. <laughs> cod appear in the same food web. And they found that the diagrams look the same. And they went, hey, we're like cod. So they do the same. They eat lots of stuff and they move on to something else and they recover and then it's all good. So that sing, 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 single strategy, if you think about it, if we apply that globally, it would be incredible. We could eat loads and loads of stuff and just let the ebb and flow happen. We could eat wild and let the ebb and flow happen. We could do that with fish if we were just clever and organised and not behoven to financial monopolies where we could actually globally decide we are now going to eat this fish and then this fish and that fish and, and so on. The ocean would be tingling with fish. See, because it's not how much we eat, you know. Before we ever arrived, everything was eating everything else. It's just there's more of us now. There's more matter concentrated in this form than that form. But it's always just exchange of matter. That's all life is. 
We've just got to work out how to make that exchange of matter be something that doesn't screw up the system. And that means we've got to start looking at the face and responding. If we did that with everything we did, if we were able to think, and we've got computer models to do it, project, what is the effect of this? It means I've got to predict what your face will be if I stand on your foot, if you see what I mean. Only it's more complex than that. So I've got to look at, so if we do this over here, what's the... And we could plan. We could, we could plan in effects and ripples into the ecosystem that make everything we do beneficial. Instead of everything we do at the moment, it's just, look, I need that. I don't care if it hurts. I'm going to have that. And that's it. That's what we're thinking now. We're just going to have it anyway, because we're psychopaths. If we learned to apply everything we have technologically and, and uh, philosophically and uh, ideologically to this problem of how we're going to be on Earth and get what we need, now that we are not just here, we're everywhere, um, we're going to have to work on that. How do I get the feedback mechanism when half of what I come get comes from somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, we've got to get back here, but we accept the fact some of it comes from somewhere else, and now we need feedback mechanisms. Anyway, that's a bit more speculative. So these are some of the details. I won't labor the point here. Loads of omega-3 acids in uh, lots of wild plants. Loads of vitamin A and C. Loads of calcium. So here is here is going to get into some biology of bonding here. Yeah. How do we how do we how do we see bonding to land and, 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 and species in terms of biology? Well, this guy come up with some amazing stuff. This is, well, you can't see the quote. He says, palates link animals with landscapes through flavor feedback mechanisms. So this guy's done some incredible work with grazing animals. And and, and, and the basic points are that animals um, just notice when they've eaten something that it has an effect on their body. And so when they have a certain need, that need is translated into a certain appetite, and that appetite is translated into seeking out the thing they need, and they get it. And you know what? They never think, oh, but I shouldn't. They never think, I want to, but oh, I mustn't. Their desire is just a direct line to get them what they need. And there's no sense that it might be problematic. See, they're not standing outside themselves trying to... But that's also because their desire is true. They do need it. So we're going to look at that in a minute. How does that get screwed up? How does that sabotage happen between what I want and what I need so that suddenly I want something that I don't need that's actually going to mess me up badly or mess you up? Anyway, this is an example of, of, of where that's not gone wrong. <laughs> so the most industrially food, uh, industrial, you know, the, 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 the mother, expecting mother that's on the most industrial diet you can imagine. Okay, she's not bonding with her environment at all, right? But she jolly well knows she's got to eat charcoal now or whatever. Because their body is loud and clear telling them, you know you need that, you want it, and you want it bad. Eat it, girl. <laughs> so there's a direct line there. It still works. It still works. We can still be normal, normal animals, like other normal animals. We still can when we're pregnant. Um, but animals will do crazy stuff. And this, this guy was observing that they will eat a dry, skanky, stinking dead mouse because it's got a mineral in it that their body needs now and so they're going to eat that. Uh, other things happen like they just chest them out or we'll feed them just carbohydrates today, let them out in the field. They eat the bit of the plant that's got the protein in it. Tomorrow they don't let them go out and feed them just protein. They go out and eat the part of exactly the same plant that's got carbohydrate in it, so they know what they need. And then um, they try doing this mix that's got the optimum level of nutrients in, and try feeding them that. But then they give them the, the, the bits, and they'll go and pick out exactly the bits, and it's not the same as their theoretical 
optimum nutrition thing. Surprisingly, animals know what they need to eat more than people that are trying to feed them artificially. So, I like to call this situation here wildland free grazers. Right? So these animals are out there on wild land. They're not fenced in. The land has been left as a wild ecosystem. So the plants that are there, the plants that want to be there, there's no artifice, there's not ryegrass monoculture. And these animals will seek out what they, uh, what they need. But they also have a little help learning what they need. So some things are quite hard to metabolize. And if the infant is exposed to that plant that's hard to metabolize while still in the womb, it comes out of the womb, watches mum eat it, eats it, and can metabolize it. But these guys over here that are fenced in and can't get access to that plant, and mum knows about that plant because she used to eat it when she was little. But she's not eating it lately, and she's not eating it when the baby's in the womb. And then they let them through once the, once the baby's out. Mum eats it, baby kind of thinks, okay mum, I'll give that a go. But there are problems. Can't metabolize it. So that's the kind of knowledge. The one in the womb that's been exposed to it knew that. That chemistry from that plant came inside because it came inside mum and down the uh, um, umbilical cord. So the baby got out and knew that and then it saw mum grazing it and then it knew that. That's what that looks like. I'm going to eat that and now I can metabolize it. The other one didn't know it. It knew that's what mum's eating but it couldn't metabolize it. So it needed to catch up and know a bit more. The other thing that happens is that mother communicates what she eats through the breast milk. So that is also going to help. So this is an absolute manifesto of pregnant ladies to eat lots of wild plants, by the way. Um, and then lastly, she communicates gut flora whilst the, whilst the infant's being born through the birth canal and through breast milk. So that is also a relationship um, that enables the infant to know the food that it ingests because it can digest it properly because it's got the right gut flora. There's a mixing there. So, what do we need? Well, we need diversity. We need diversity of plants and organisms because we need diversity of nutrients, lots of different things. Um, and a lot of those nutrients um, come in the form and would have been traditionally available um, through the form of, of strong tasting wild plants. So that's a challenge once you first start to um, uh, engage with that, unless you had um, a wild land free grazing mother. So I regret to announce I did not. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you did. But we need to have some now, please. We need some wild land free grazing mothers to enable their children before they're born and before they're weaned from the breast to know that, to know that these plants give me what I need and I want them. Because if you don't know them, you don't want them. And you go, oh, that's a bit bitter. That's a bit chewy. That's a bit strong. Can't I have some sugar? I know that. Well, wild plants are chewy. That's because they've got dietary fibre. And that's the other thing we need. We need that in our guts. That enables us to hold the food for long enough to slowly digest and release the things that we need. This stuff is really good. This is uh, Ascophyllomedosa, more egg rack. It's got more um, micronutrients than any other kind of thing I know of. Um, including that, what's that? Spirulina. Spirulina. Got a much more impressive nutrient profile than spirulina. 
and it grows in the sea. So whereas our plants that we cultivate are becoming more and more nutrient poor because the soil's getting worse and the cultivars are cultivated to be sweet and fat and have a long shelf life instead of being tasty or nutritious, we're not getting those nutrients from, from vegetables. It's gone way, way down since the 50s, the, the data tells us. Well, the plants like this are still in the sea and they're taking all of these minerals out of the sea. So you can make good your diet with, with a seaweed. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just have this intuitive sense about this seaweed that it is. it looks a bit like an umbilical cord and I feel like when I'm eating it, I'm rebonding with, with land in a way that's kind of necessary. And um, secondly, it's full of dietary fiber, the best kind of soluble fiber, that sort of gloopy, gelatinous kind of stuff. So that means if you eat lousy food like white pasta and white bread, but you've got some of this in it, it slows its passage through the gut and turns it into a slow release, low GI food. Consequently, a bunch of guys who are overweight would just put on a diet where they had to eat two slices of toast a day with this stuff in it. And they all lost weight because it just meant they didn't get hungry again so quickly and, and they all lost weight. I'm not saying they went from massive to skinny overnight, but they all did lose weight. So it just shows that it would, would definitely take you in the right direction. So that's, uh, yeah, to me that's, that's restoring a bond there, just, just to eat that one. But it, it it's, uh, points the right way for, for the general thing to embrace strong flavours and fibrous foods. Now this is uh, the story of uh, an orange that gets pressed and turned into juice and sent all over the world. And it's got a bit of compound in it called limonin. Now, limonin is also a known anti-cancer compound. Recently, they've discovered a way to get it out. So now, the orange juice is more sweet. So people drink more of it, because they like sugar. They don't like bitterness. And I just think that's incredible. That's, uh, Let's take something good out because people find it challenging and then we'll sell more stuff mm. and uh, it won't be beneficial whereas it was before. Yeah, this is just... Uh, so we're talking about severing the bonds here with, with some of these tricks that, that are in the food system as, as it stands. You can eat a whole meal that's pretty much just that. So the beef is fed on maize. That Coke is um, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, and even the fries are made from maize, apparently. Uh, and the thing is, that kind of food, by the way, the thing I didn't say about the gut flora was that if, 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 if mum, unfortunately, is an industrial food lady, uh, her gut flora is going to say, give me sugar and carbs. And that's, that's a very interesting thing. So there's, there's, there's an example of one and what you don't need. There's an example of sabotage. So the sugar and the carbs, because they live in your belly so much, they, they create their own little ecosystem down there. It's an ecosystem that's based on lack of diversity. And it means that you um, are being controlled by those bacteria. They send signal chemicals to your brain saying, you want this, and um, you're only satisfied when your blood is just screaming with sugar. So this kind of food then is uh, creating bondage, not bonding. You see, that's a link, but it's not a very good one. So, we need to get back to the bonds, I think. Um, we need to get back to how uh, we biologically communicate these things. That's your job, ladies. I can't contribute much to that. Um, but we also need to get back to uh, 
as in my experience for working with plants, it's all those sort of back ladies. So this this is an Aboriginal elder in in uh, California. We've been watching her videos, Joel Fanny's videos, because uh, we were talking about tending the wild. She's trying to revive the uh, culture around acorns uh, there, but. Uh, because plants are the preserve of women traditionally in, in these cultures, they're the ones that are custodians of this knowledge. So this kind of bond and link. Um, but um, this is what it all boils down to for me. If, 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 if we're going to... Can you see now what I mean? We're going to go home because we know what we want. So we're going to get away from this sabotage that happens. Um, and you know, it's quickly, there's just one, there's one more kind of sabotage that I've missed. So, so flavour chemistry is just this evil thing that um, takes things again out of context. If you eat a packet of potato crisps, what you've got there is something that's high in carbohydrate, very low in protein. But they put these things in there, which are umami flavour chemicals. Now, umami is is a wonderful thing to tell your body that it's going to get something it needs. Your body wants protein. When you taste umami, it's signaling the presence of protein. It's there in meat and mushrooms and, 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 and all sorts of things, seaweed, that, that, that are high in, um, in um, protein. Interestingly, nettles are high in protein and we've been fermenting them and making a sauce. It's an intensely umami flavoured sauce. So that's what it's telling you. And it's telling you the truth. Okay? You want what you need, you want Umami, give me some of that, it tastes so good, I want some more. That's all good stuff. No animal would argue with that. However, that packet of crisps ain't got no protein in it. Or very, very little. Right? So, you're going to eat it and not be satisfied. And that's how you can tell, really, that that's not the right one. You know, this, I want it, I want it, I want it so bad. But, are you satisfied though? You knew you shouldn't and you did. Were you satisfied, really? And that's it. Animals don't suffer from that. Because no one's sabotaging their system like this. Artificial sweeteners tell us sweet little lies. You're going to get some glucose in your blood any second now. Drink it down. Your body gets ready for that. So it's really bad. Apart from the fact that spartamine and whatever else is bad for you. The thing that's bad for you is that your body gets geared up to digest something that ain't there. Same with the protein. Your body's releasing protease to digest protein. That's why you can't stop eating this stuff. You keep on eating because your body's going, uh, excuse me, you know that protein you told me that I was going to get? I haven't any yet. Could you just put some more of that stuff that tastes like protein? And so sabotage. We're cutting, we're cutting, we're cutting. So I don't know. I don't know if I've adequately made the case that these links are being severed and how they're being severed in relation to food but I'm saying we want to start bonding again with land we want to start bonding again with species and guess what the only way to do that is to bond with each other because these things happen in community when people gather together when people eat together when people learn and create as we have to do now brand new culture around the wild species that surround us brand new recipes and brand new ceremonies and celebrations and, and uh, festivals. That's what we've got to do. Um, and we're going to restore those vital connections and, um, and then we'll all look as flourishing and healthy as these guys. <laughs> okay, that's it.